Bio Info Congress 3 Doktor Mustafa Aydoğan Çekirdeksiz Sitoplazma Bölünmesi Doktor Mustafa Aydoğan, lisans eğitimini Colorado Üniversitesi Moleküler, Hücresel ve Gelişimsel Biyoloji bölümünde tamamlamıştır. Doktor eğitimini Oxford Üniversitesi Patoloji Okulu'nda almış ve aynı zamanda doktora çalışması sayesinde İngiliz Hücre Biyolojisi Derneği'nden Yılın Genç Hücre Biyoloğu ödülünü almaya hak kazanmıştır. Doktor Aydan şu anda Kaliforniya Üniversitesi Biyokimya ve Biyofizik bölümünde baş araştırmacı olarak çalışmalarına devam etmektedir. Aydan Laboratuvarı, hücre döngüsü ve sirkadyen saatlerin klasik bilgisinin ötesinde ortaya çıkan biyolojik zaman kontrolü mekanizmalarını araştırmaktadır. Doktor Aydan ve ekibi, büyümekte olan biyolog topluluğunun bir parçası olarak otonom saatleri araştırmaktadırlar. Spesifik olarak sitoplazmik organizasyon ve organel biyolojisine, erken embriyogenezde organizma gelişimini ve metabolizmayı düzenleyen zamanlama mekanizmalarına odaklanmaktadır. Bay Info Congress 3 Dr. Mustafa Aydoğan Cytoplasmic Divisions Without Nuclei Dr. Mustafa Aydoğan completed his undergraduate education in the Department of Molecular, Cellular, Developmental Biology at the University of Colorado. He obtained his PhD from the University of Oxford, School of Pathology, and received the Young Cell Biologist of the Year runner-up award from the British Society for Cell Biology in the recognition of his doctoral work. He currently works as a principal investigator in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics at University of California. Aydoğan Lab studies emerging mechanisms of biological time control beyond the classic knowledge of the cell cycle and the circadian clocks. As part of the growing community of biologists investigating autonomous crops, his group focuses on timing mechanisms that regulate organismal development and metabolism in early embryogenesis, with a particular interest in cytoplasmic organization and organelle biology. Sayın Doktor Mustafa Aydan ve değerli katılımcılarımız, Bayinfo Kangaroo Tri etkinliğimize hepiniz hoş geldiniz. Değerli hocamız bizlere bugün Cytoplasmic Division Without Nuclear konulu bir konuşma gerçekleştirecektir. Konuşma bitiminde ekibimizin hazırladığı ve değerli katılımcılarımızdan gelen soruca- sorularla soru cevap bölümümüz gerçekleştirecektir. Tekrardan hoş geldiniz hocam. Sağ olasın Elif Nur. Çok teşekkür ederim. Nazik davetiniz için çok mutlu oldum. Bu arada bu hani YouTube'da olan sayın seyirciler yani bu saatte cumartesi akşamı gidip de başka bir şey yapmayıp bu konuşmayı dinlemeye geldiğiniz için size de hürmetlerimi sunuyorum. Hocam biz çok teşekkür ediyoruz davetimizi kabul ettiğiniz için. Çok mutlu olduk. Sağ olasın. Hocam dilerseniz sunumunuza başlayabilirsiniz. Peki tamam. Ekranımı görüyorsunuz değil mi? Hemen şimdi bunu full ekran yapacağım. Nasıl? Evet. Evet hocam şu an tam olarak görebiliyoruz ekranınızı. Tamam çok teşekkürler. Ee, kusuruma evet. bakmayın. Ee, yabancı davetler olduğu için ve konuşmanın süresi hasebiyle e, konuşmamı İngilizce yapacağım. E, ama herhangi bir sorunuz olursa hemen sorun veyahut e, en sonda sorun herhalde en sonda soruluyor. E, ona göre de yanıtlarım ama soruları Türkçe alıp Türkçe cevaplayacağım. Hiçbir problem olmaz. What I'm going to talk about today is uh, something that we have been looking at in the lab 
is a form of serendipity, actually. It's not something that we intended to study, but it's something that we have uh, stumbled upon along the way while doing something else. And I will uh, get to that later on. But in general, my lab uh, focuses on how uh, biological timing mechanisms uh, in, in cells work, and we're trying to understand the subcellular mechanisms that drive uh, those timing mechanisms. So before I begin my talk, I really want to pay an homage to nature because this wonderful event that's called mitotic divisions is really the propeller of life. And when I say that, I don't mean to exaggerate it because what you see here are uh, mammalian cells that are dividing in a tissue culture. And while they're doing that, they're going through all sorts of events that's called the cell cycle and especially the mitotic cycle because these cells are going through these mitotic divisions. Now, if I were to stop these cell divisions in your bodies, yes, in your bodies, you will likely will die within a few days. It's how much mitotic divisions are important. And the second picture I'm showing you is uh, a plant root. And what you see here is uh, these white areas uh, on, the, on the video, let me play it again, where you could see that these green areas are lighting up. And that's basically an indication of where the wound is induced. Cells are starting to divide to repair the wound. So what I mean by that is cells not only proliferate when you have to grow the body, but also proliferate or induce to proliferate when you induce wounds in the body. And that's very important. And likewise, what you see here is the development of an embryo uh, from a salamander. And you could see that the size of the embryo here is folds bigger, folds bigger than a regular cell. You know the cells are regularly 10 micron, and this embryo is actually at the right scale to the salamander that you see here. It's huge, yet the type of behavior it shows to divide, it looks very similar to what we see both in uh, what we see in uh, mammals as well as in plants. So the futures that define mitotic divisions are totally universal. So what do we know about the molecular players that control mitotic divisions? Well, before getting to that, let's look at this textbook picture of what we think is the cell cycle. And what you see here is what's called S phase where the DNA is in the nucleus and it replicates and through the mitotic process, these DNA are going to align and segregate. And through cytokinesis, in other words, cytoplasmic divisions, nuclei will segregate. And this has been named the M phase, the mitotic phase. Decades of work went into understanding the molecular players behind uh, the scenes. And um, in 2001, Lee Hartwell uh, Tim Hunt and Paul Nurse got the Nobel Prize for discovering the key mechanisms and the molecules that drive uh, the nuclear cycles. And briefly, what happens is that the cyclins, these are molecules that bind to CDKs, the cyclin-dependent kinases. And when they do that, they can start phosphorylating certain substrates that are important to progress the cell cycle. And what's important to know is not only this core event that's key, but also these auxiliary feedback loops that are helpful, A, in resetting the cell cycle, because what you see here is as the cyclin CDK complex gets activated at the end of the cell cycle, some machinery has to degrade it such that you can start another cell cycle. And that's the APC complex, which essentially impinges as a negative feedback loop on the CDK machinery. But then there are these molecules called V1 and CDC25, which are known to receive cues from the cell. For example, if you have any problem with DNA replication, for example, DNA replication is delayed or some damages with DNA while it's replicating, then what V1 does is that it slows the CDK cycle machinery and CDK cycle machinery is very excited. So it also wants to slow V1, and so they have this double negative feedback loop. Meanwhile, CDC25 is a phosphatase that 
counteracts on the phosphorylation V1 induces on CDK1 to put CDK1 back in charge. So in essence, this has been uh, the, our understanding of how the nuclear cycles uh, continue. Now, what I show you here is basically our current understanding, or uh, so, for, uh, so far the textbook uh, knowledge of the cell cycle, which is to say cell cycle starts with a certain transcription events, and you have to kickstart a metabolic flux to producing ATP. And then there are these structures called centrioles that I've studied as a PhD student. And, and the important thing about centrioles is that they are there to ensure a, a spindle assembly that's, that have good fidelity while it's uh, uh, segregating the chromosomes. Um, but then uh, once you go after central duplications, you have to de replicate the DNA. This is a mitotic cycle. And once you replicate the DNA, you can go through the nuclear envelope breakdown and chromosome condensation, which is ensued by cytoplas cytoplasmic divisions. Now, long decades of work, basically, from multiple labs and multiple investigators came to uh, conclude that there seems to be a ratchet mechanism going on throughout the cell cycle. That is to say, CDK1 activity starts low, and that's highlighted by the light color here, and it starts getting stronger throughout the cell cycle. And our understanding has been that this increase in the CDK1 activity is what triggers these events. So for instance, when there's a little bit of CDK1 activity, you can kickstart transcription. Uh, when there's a little bit more, you could do DNA replication and the rest, you name it. And so this has been called the ratchet model of the cell cycle. However, there has been multiple studies, many studies within just the past decades, including the work that I've done during my doctorate, that started challenging uh, this model in a way that was essentially showing that, if, for example, class of messages, class of mRNA, can be transcribed, class of genes can be transcribed periodically independently of the CDK cycling oscillator. So that was interesting. And then a group of other works have shown that even the metabolic cycles can go through their own autonomous cycles that's independent of the cell cycle, also independent of the circadian clock. So a lot of investigators are now recognizing that the metabolic cycles of ATP or NADH that are going out of phase could go through their cycles independently. And portion of the work that I was involved in has demonstrated that an autonomous clock regulates centrial duplications, which can occur independently of the cell cycle. So this was, this was an important uh, challenge to the current model of the cell cycle. And likewise, we have known for a long time, and recently in endogenous conditions, in wild type conditions, that cycles of DNA replication can continue without cell divisions in wild type polyploid cells. So it turns out that you have wild type polyploid cells in your bodies, or you know, as a vertebrate you do, but as an invertebrate flies do too. So it's not something that's specific to mammalians, but also exists in anil, other uh, animal species. And finally, very recently, uh, the group of uh, Eric Vischaus, who actually uh, received the Nobel Prize for uh, discovering some of the genes that control morphogenesis, found that rising levels of CDK1 activity may not account for nuclear envelope breakdown or even chromosome condensation. So some of these things that you think as tenet uh, uh, events of the cell cycle could even be uh, triggered independently of CDK1 activity. And a final sentence in Eric Vischaus's paper from this publication last year has summarized it very well that Together, all these results suggest that the role of CDK1 as the master regulator of the cell cycle might not be as general as previously assumed. So what about cytoplasmic divisions? So what I'm going to talk about today is sort of going to relate to and focus on cytoplasmic divisions and its relationship to the cell cycle. So what do we know about cytoplasmic divisions? Well, here is a textbook picture uh, of the cell cycle. And during the M phase, you could see that the mitosis is sort of put together, clustered with cytokinesis, 
in other words, cytoplasmic divisions, as a batch event. So it's been sort of uh, postulated to us that cytoplasmic divisions are a sequel, are a result of nuclear divisions in eukaryotes because they directly end through the nuclear divisions. They follow up right after uh, the nuclear divisions. Well, this is an idea, but in theory, there are three potential models that could follow or challenge this idea. So there could be a sequential model where successful completion of nuclear divisions might lead to cytoplasmic division, which is to say, only if you were to be able to finish nuclear division, then you can divide the cytoplasm. And the other one is the most common model that uh, most of us believe in uh, lecture halls or the laboratories is the master oscillator model. And in that, the CDK cyclin oscillator, as I've shown in the previous slide, would trigger cytoplasmic divisions. And an alternative model is that we have no idea what's going on. Well, I again want to put in the words of a giant in the field, Tom Pollard, in a review that he published five years ago, which is titled Nine Unanswered Questions About Cytokinesis. And the question that he proposes that hasn't been answered is that what actually triggers contractile ring constriction and cytokinetic furrow formation? And I want to read this as a whole, if you don't mind. Cyclin-dependent kinases provide the top level of control for cytokinesis along with all other aspects of the cell cycle. In particular, the transition to anaphase and furrow formation in animal cells depends on degradation of cyclin B and termination of CDK1 kinase activity. The downstream pathways that trigger contractile ring constriction have not been established. So we have this clean slate that we're looking at. Excuse me. Today, the work I'm going to show is led by wonderful, a wonderful technician, Anand Bakshi, and a great postdoc, Fabio Chegaraitura, in our lab, and wonderfully helped by genetically Andrew Alamban and our collaborators, Sophie Dumont and Mikael Rosa Salvans at UCSF, as well as our dear colleagues, Sheila Campbell, Bill Sullivan, and Pat O'Farrell. And here's a picture from my laboratory where we're sitting and picnicking on a beach in uh, San Francisco. So if you're also interested in beaching and picnicking in San Francisco, please send me an email. So I'm going to make an argument right before I show some results. And the argument is that I'd like to convince you embryogenesis is a hotbed, is a wonderful platform for discovering biological time control mechanisms and doing this at a fundamental level. And let me demonstrate this with this video that I've showed before, uh, coming from one of my undergraduate mentors, Dick McIntosh at CU Boulder, is that if you um, were to watch, um, actually, let me repeat this and repeat this properly. If you were to watch these two videos, what you will see is cell culture cells dividing in media, and a fly embryo developing up to its nearly the end of embryogenesis and start of the larval stage. You see that the two videos happen at the same time. While one happened over five days, the other one happened over one day. Five days is the cell culture and one day is the embryogenesis. So evolution likely traded in for speed and robust time control mechanisms during embryogenesis. How comes such a behemoth thing? develop five times faster than cells that have confluented the culture within five days. That's amazing. But to achieve this, embryos have some tricks. And the tricks involve having weak mitotic checkpoints and low expression of P53. So if you run into any damages during mitosis, you don't necessarily stop the mitosis. So you may end up with a lot of chromosome damages, but they get eliminated. There are certain pathways. Early embryogenesis is stripped from major gap phases, in part freeing from several inputs from growth signals. As you see, the embryo sits as a whole thing. It's not necessarily growing. So the growth signals aren't necessarily putting a lot of pressure for cell cycle to wait for that, the gap phases, for mitosis to happen. And finally, something that's extremely confounding in many biological timing studies, which is 
the influence of the circadian clock. The circadian clock genes are not expressed until up to the larval stage, and this is true for many organisms. And it is also true for the system we study uh, majorly in the lab, that is the fly embryogenesis. So let me give you a little bit of an overview of the fly embryogenesis and the cytoplasmic organization at the early stages of the blastoderm formation. So what you see here is a fly egg, and that's about 500 micron here. And what you see, this little thing here is a nucleus. As you see, the nuclei after fertilization will go through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine cycles. And at the 10th cycle, you see that these nuclei that were in the middle of the embryo are now going to the periphery of the embryo. And right when you go to the periphery of the embryo, they start forming for the first time organization of the cytoplasm that will start encapsulating these nuclei in the middle. So what you see here with the red and the blue compartments is basically these what's called energets of sequestered cytoplasmic regions where the nuclei and their organelles are hosted. And if you were to look at this as a time-lapse video, uh, they are called cycles of cortex cleavages. You could see how the cytoplasm will divide while the nuclei are dividing. Great. And just to reiterate again, uh, in the embryos, we see that the CDK1 uh, oscillator is going through these cycles, and you don't have any gap phases, so you don't have the classic G1, G2 phases, but you go through DNA synthesis, mitosis, DNA synthesis, mitosis. So we wanted to study these things as well, but um, Anand, who is the technician in our lab, had an observation that was sort of weird and sort of serendipitous and sort of concerning, which is that he started saying that these cytoplasmic divisions that he sees don't necessarily match the nuclear cycles. And I thought, what the hell are you talking about, Anand? You know, for many years, lots of people said that these are one-to-one. -one. I mean, we have to really carefully demonstrate this, or we have to be extremely careful in what we're seeing. So he then looked at, he generated flies that had uh, this MRLCGFP. This is the uh, myosin regulatory light chain, which shows us the cytoplasmic compartments. And he also looked at the nuclear marker with histone uh, 2 RFP. And you could see that the cytoplasmic compartments are in a one-to-one -one ratio for majority of the cases. About 80% of the nuclei are encapsulated by a single compartment. Great. But what he also saw, which was the most exciting part, is that while you were in interface, you could see the nuclei haven't condensed anything. So they're still in the S phase stage of the cell cycle. The compartments, if you look at them in the apical axis, compartments started to divide. So if you follow this uh, white arrows and the yellow arrows, how they duplicate during interface, while the nuclei in the basal channel are not duplicating or even condensing. So this was shocking. So I thought maybe this is just the quirk of the myosin bridges and stuff like that. So I said to Anand, well, we got to make some fly lines where we look, could look at, you know, plasma membrane and things like actin. And so he did. So we looked at an actin binding protein called moisin. And so this is moisin GFP and looking at nuclei together. And what we saw on the left side is majority of the cases, we see that the nuclei are one-to-one -one ratio with the cytoplasmic compartments. In about 20% of the cases, these compartments are dividing through the interface before mitosis or even before uh, nuclear envelope breakdown. So that was shocking. And likewise, with plasma membrane marker, which is represented by tall venus here, you could see that during the S phase, these compartments divide, whereas the nuclei don't do anything. So this is very exciting, but this is also very uncomforting. So we wanted to check the, the question whether cytoplasmic divisions actually require accompanying nuclei. So if we were not to see nuclei there, or if you were to remove nuclei altogether or block the cell cycle altogether, the nuclear cycle altogether, 
would we see cytoplasmic deficiency? Well, what we've observed in that to a very little extent, about three to four percent, but reproducibly in the cytoplasm, we saw conditions, if you pay attention to the apical channel with these white and yellow arrows, these compartments that are there, and if you check the basal site without any nuclei. And these compartments do divide and do divide without any nuclear divisions, basically. And I just want to run this, <coughs> excuse me, as a video for you to observe and appreciate what I mean by that. So these are in the middle compartments without nuclei. And they're just taking a break from nuclear cycles. <laughs> Interestingly, if you repeat this experiment with the actin marker or plasma membrane marker, like in the myosin channel that we were observing, we could see that the cytoplasmic divisions without uh, cytoplasmic compartments without any nuclei beneath them also exist and also divide. And again, a very small fraction of the compartments uh, do this. But nevertheless, cytoplasmic compartments can divide without accompanying nuclei. Um, this was interesting, correlative, coincident, but we wanted to test this a little more deterministically because all of these, what you've seen so far, are just wild type embryos. It's amazing, but it's correlative. So the question we asked first is, are early cytoplasmic divisions just stochastic events? Are these just random things happening exogenously? Um, or are they part of a regulated program across space and time? Is there some interesting program that's controlling these divisions independently of the nuclear cycles? So what we did is we examined the embryo from uh, its anterior to posterior axis, and here are different regions in that axis that we're examining. And what we found is that the cytoplasmic divisions that occur during interface before mitosis, you could see that they happen pretty synchronously throughout time during the cell cycle. You could see they happen, start happening about the same time. And we wanted to quantify this. And what we found indeed is that there are very narrow regions throughout the interface, and NEB here is the nuclear envelope breakdown, that these divisions occur. And importantly, they're not necessarily a function of something local happening, but they happen throughout the AP axis and throughout all over the embryo. So it's not necessarily some local thing concentrating and triggering uh, these divisions, but it, it happens throughout the embryo. And this is one example that I'm showing here. And if you don't believe it, look at a second example embryo where you could still see these early divisions, a lot of early divisions, and that they're happening as a function of uh, AP axis randomly, not necessarily as a function of something local that's happening. So now the question is, is the cell cycle progression or other nuclei that decorate the cortex? Because when I was showing you all these videos, Although there are cytoplasmic compartments without nuclei, there are nuclei that are accompanying nearby. So maybe there's some neighboring effect. Would this be required for cytoplasmic compartmentalization and division? So it's, it's almost like a caveat of the previous experiments that I showed you. Well, to test that, we want to start somewhere. And that somewhere came from our understanding, our readily understanding of the nuclear cycles, where, as I've told you, if the cyclins activate CDK once, and that cyclins have to be degraded every cell cycle right about here so that the CDK activity can sharply go down, that means new protein synthesis is required for the nuclear cycles. That is to say, if I block protein synthesis, if I block translation, you may go through one cell cycle, but you're not going to go through any more cell cycles because the nuclear division stops. So we wanted to test this with a cyclohexamide, which is an inhibitor of translation initiation. And stunningly, what we found is that in the cyclohexamide experiments, even though the nuclear divisions essentially stop, they don't continue, the cytoplasmic divisions can continue. And we've also repeated these experiments with other conditions, and we can find that cytoplasmic divisions, although I don't show it here, could continue multiple rounds even if the nuclear division stopped. 
And again, quantifying this have indicated that there must be a program that controls these divisions because they happen at a very narrow time through their arrest after the cyclohexamide uh, treatment and that they happen as a function of the entire embryo. So indicating that this is not a locality effect uh, that's going on. And here's just another example uh, of the same quantification. Well, that's great and all, but when you block protein translation, you block translation of many things, right? So can we do this experiment a little more specifically? To do that, we wanted to halt the nuclear cycles by a treatment of double-stranded RNA against cyclin A, cyclin B, and cyclin B3, and essentially do this at, at the very beginning of the embryogenesis, literally cycle one of life so that the nuclei cannot perpetuate and keep dividing and make thousands of nuclei in the embryo. And then we would wait after this treatment about 90 minutes to a time that we would have normally examined the embryos, like in the videos that I've showed you early on. And what we found is that despite the fact that there are virtually no nuclei along the cortex of the embryo, we find that cytoplasm can compartmentalize and then have several unique things that normal cells have and continue their divisions. And what you see here is, for example, an example compartment with its centrioles. And you could see how this compartment divides virtually without any nuclei. And likewise, what I show here with a centrosomal marker, the microtubules, and you could see how the division occurs and repeating the same protocol essentially with a plasma membrane marker and how the plasma membrane at the bottom can divide without any nuclear divisions. And I want to show that this is not necessarily limited to a single cycle. This happens in almost in perpetuity. And you could see that through this video that I'm going to run, Jupiter M. cherry here marks microtubules and MRLC, as I said, marks cytoplasmic compartments. And look at how beautifully these things are going through several rounds of divisions uh, and all happening in an embryo devoid of nuclei. And something very interesting about this, all of this, is that while the period of nuclear divisions are regularly are about 15 minutes, period of cytoplasmic divisions are about eight minutes, whereas the period of central duplications, which uh, was the result of my PhD work in Oxford, was, was 20 minutes. So that indicates that all of these cycles seem to be independent, regulated by their own cycles in, periodic, uh, in a periodic rhythm, and they all have different frequencies. So that really indicates that uh, there are some underlying autonomous clocks. And we've, we were fortunate to discover that for central duplications. And we were um, others for years have shown that for nuclear divisions. And I think the next big task is to do that for cytoplasmic divisions. Now, I said it's the next big task, but it really is a big task. And going into a genetic screen to try to identify the uh, molecules that drive cytoplasmic divisions may not yield anything unless you really understand the cytological requirements for cytoplasmic divisions so that you can tweak, tweak your experiments in such a way that you don't get baffled by the nuclear division cycle or its effects on the cytoplasmic divisions but purely focus on cytoplasmic divisions. So to be able to do that, we first have to understand what are some necessary and sufficient conditions for cytoplasmic divisions. And we've been uh, doing that for a while. And the first question we were asking is, are centrioles essential for cytoplasmic divisions? Why? Because you know centrioles can also duplicate autonomously. Uh, and we when we looked at centrioles, they're basically in any nuclei that we were looking at, uh, any compartment that we were looking at. And you could see here that this cytoplasmic compartment uh, uh, in cycle 11, despite the fact that uh, it doesn't have any nucleus from the left, I'm talking about the left panels, um, you could see that uh, uh, it can still divide, but yet it does have centrioles, these green stuff in it. So this sort of led us to believe that maybe there are uh, uh, some centrioler regulated requirements for the cytoplasmic divisions. And what we did to test that is um, we wanted to get rid of centrioles from a compartment. And doing this with the Dumont lab, Sophie Dumont's lab at UCSF, um, and 
ablate the centrioles with lasers and then follow cytoplasmic divisions. And what I'm showing you is an example of that, where here is a cytoplasmic compartment. And this cytoplasmic compartment, prior to the experiment or watching these cytoplasmic compartment, we basically ablated these centrioles and essentially nothing is left. So on the upper panel, you could see the centrioles are ablated. And on the bottom panel, you could see they're gone. And what you see here is that cytoplasmic division can continue despite the fact that centrioles are gone. Uh, and here's the centrioler plane as a control that centrioles are indeed gone. So this was very shocking, at least to me, as a person who studied centrioles before, they were dear to me, but sadly they aren't required uh, for the cytoplasmic divisions in the, in, the, in the wild type embryos. And then the next question we wanted to ask is whether, so we found that centrioles may not be necessary for these divisions, but could they be sufficient to induce uh, compartment formations? And how we would test this is we essentially looked at unfertilized eggs where there are no nuclei, there are no centrioles, and you could see that in an example egg or egg two, um, you don't see any cytoplasmic compartment formation like the circles that I was showing you. And we wanted to trick the egg, not the embryo, the egg, to induce uh, de novo uh, centrioles. And this is a trick that was published before by the lab of Monica Betancourt Diaz. And the idea is if we overexpress the centriolar enzyme, PLK4, we may be able to induce de novo centriole formation, so centriole formation from scratch and rather than duplications. And you could see on the upper channel, centrioles are indeed induced to form, but bottom channel where we should see the compartments, we don't see any compartments. So that really indicates that even if we induce centriole biogenesis in an unfertilized egg where there are no nuclei, there is no cell cycle, uh, we don't form uh, any compartments. So that was very important. So this indicated that centrioles may not be necessary uh, for compartment divisions, nor sufficient for the compartment formation. But an interesting that we found is that microtubule polymerization is key, but that's not necessarily depending on centrosomal microtubules or an intact spindle per se, but is rather a requirement that's requiring a pool of microtubules rather than a specific pool of microtubules. So what do I mean by that? So in this panel, we're looking at the microtubule marker and the cytoplasmic compartment marker, and you can see everything is merry and happy. But when we treat this embryos with colchicine, which is a potent inhibitor of microtubule polymerization, you could see all the microtubules are gone, and so are the compartments. But interestingly, if we target merely centrosomal microtubules and not other sources of microtubules, what we see something remarkable with low, low dose of nacodazole is that chromatin starts nucleating microtubules, which is a well-known phenomenon in the field. And this seems to be sufficient to form compartment-like structures that indicates that other sources of microtubules can also maintain cytoplasmic compartments. So that's, that was sort of very interesting. But this raised the question because in arrested embryos that I've shown you, where we stopped the nuclear cycle so there were no nuclei, if we get rid of the centrosomal uh, uh, mediation of microtubules there by laser ablating centrioles, would those compartments continue dividing? The short answer was no. So the interesting thing is that if you ablate a centriole within a compartment in the arrested embryo where there are no nuclei, but there are these cytoplasmic divisions, they don't continue their division, but the compartments that do have centrioles do continue their division. So that indicated that if you were to remove that other major source of microtubules, being the chromatin, yes, now you do depend on the centrosomal microtubules, indicating that under normal condition, centrosomal microtubules may be important for the regulation and robust assembly of compartments and their timely uh, divisions. So that was very interesting. So microtubules are one way of regulating cytoskeleton, right? But there's also the story of actin. 
And one of the important things about actin is its myosin-2 base contractility. Myosin-2 base contractility is what enables actin to do movements that are required for uh, cortex contractions. And so we wanted to ask whether actin's myosin-2 base contractility is required for cytoplasmic divisions. And the way we have done it is we've injected the embryos with a molecule that inhibits uh, uh, uh, ROC kinase, which is the key upstream kinase that phosphorylates myosin, re, um, phosphorylation that's required for myosin's ability to contract through the actin. And you could see that ROC kinase treatment indeed gets rid of the myosin signal, which is depicted in green at the upper channel. And at the bottom channel, you could see this applied with a ROC kinase inhibitor, the, the green is gone. But we have noticed that if you look at this bottom third, third panel, you could see that as if there are these hazes, as if there are these halos of compartment-like things that sort of made us go and think like, what the hell? Maybe we should look at this with another marker like moisin, so independent of myosin. And stunningly, we saw that if we were to do rokinase inhibition, where myosin is localization is lost, actin can still form compartments. But the devil's detail here is that the compartments form a lot slower. As you see here, the compartment assembly takes a lot longer than in the control. So that really indicated that actin actin's myosin-based contractility may be not necessary for compartment formation. It is necessary for a timely assembly of compartment formation. And importantly, in these embryos that are treated with rokinase, uh, treated with a rokinase inhibitor, we could still see cytoplasmic divisions without nuclear divisions. So that's very interesting. And we could also see cytoplasmic divisions without nuclei. But importantly, as I inferred, because the compartment formation is slow, sometimes you see that a single compartment has these binucleated uh, situations where sometimes two nuclei like each other so much that they come and fuse. And they form these structures called syncarions. And syncarions are a very bad sign uh, for genome integrity because they could lead to all sorts of uh, aneuploidies. So you don't want that. And that means that actomyosin's contractility helps compartments and the nuclei to be in phase with each other to avoid uh, these type of events. So it seems that uh, actin's uh, myosin-based contractus is dispensable for cytoplasmic division. And what we wanted to know is whether cytoplasmic compartments are at all required for nuclear division. So if the two things are autonomous, would the other uh, be required for the other? And what we tested is that by blocking with cytoclysin B, blocking actin polymerization, we could see that actin, plasma membrane, uh, everything is gone. And yet the microtubule uh, uh, polymerization is still intact. Yet the nuclei are still fine and go through their divisions. And let me show you. So here the compartments are gone, but the nuclei are continuing their divisions. But let's see how they continue their divisions, because it matters. It matters for development that these very early nuclei keep their genomic integrity. But what you'll start noticing is that in embryos where there are no compartments, as is depicted on the left, throughout the cell cycles, the nuclei are start running into these problems, all sorts of damages, and starts to you know, touch each other, and starts to go through all sorts of weird damages. Um, and, and so it indicates that the presence of cytoplasmic compartments is key for preventing nuclear damages. And so that's sort of a passive form of protection from damages. So we wondered um, whether there's an active coordination between these two cycles to avoid other sorts of damages. And, and that raises a question, you know, you told us cytoplasmic divisions are autonomous, but why should animals like flies keep cytoplasmic and nuclear divisions autonomous from each other? What's the physiological advantage of this? Why shouldn't the two be coupled so heavily that we should never see cytoplasm dividing uh, autonomously of the nuclei? 
That's a valid, valid question. Well, an answer came from an astute observation that we found a while just carefully looking at the relationship between cytoplasmic divisions and nuclear divisions. So in regular nuclei, what you see is that the nuclei right before mitosis is going to break their envelope. So in the top uh, panel, the dark hole in the third, um, uh, third row, um, you could see that the nuclei are going through a breakdown while the chromosome is condensing. So everything is fine, you're going into mitosis, and in the next cell cycle, you do divide the nuclei and you do divide the cytoplasmic compartment. Everything is happy. But a very small fraction of the nuclei in the embryo, about 5% of the uh, nuclei in the embryos, go through this weird cycle where the nuclei stole in their cycle, which is to say they stole in their ability to divide, so they're not going to divide. And they actually delay into mitosis. You could see a regular nucleus within the same embryo has gone into mitosis and broke its envelope. But this guy didn't. But strikingly, the cytoplasmic compartments above them did. And did so far earlier than the ones that were going through a regular uh, compartment and nuclear division. And in the next cell cycle, despite the fact that nucleus didn't divide, you see the compartments have divided. And importantly, this compartment division above the undivided nucleus have seemed to push this nucleus out of the frame. To put in cartoon model, you can see that in a regular cell cycle, as I've shown you here on the left top uh, panels, the nuclear envelope breaks down and the cell cycle happens regularly while the nuclei divide and the cytoplasmic compartments divide. In this bottom situation, the nucleus doesn't divide, and yet the cytoplasmic compartment divide, and that sort of, sort of appear to extrude the nuclei from the blastoderm and let them away uh, from the periphery of the embryo, which is key for uh, the, uh, uh, the morphogenesis of the fly development. So are we discovering for the first time a programmed elimination of nuclei? Hell no. I mean, there have been other groups who have studied these type of concepts for a long time. And one of the most important ways of nuclear elimination from the blastoderm was due to karyotype damages. So what is a karyotype damage? It's a type of chromosome segregation errors or DNA damages that lead to lagging chromosome during anaphase, which triggers an event called nuclear fallout. And nuclear fallout is essentially controlled by a mechanism that's CHEK2 dependent. This is a molecule uh, that can control the downstream kinases regulating the cell cycle. And essentially, if you damage the DNA, as you see here, uh, the mitotic spindle still forms and the nuclei are still dividing, but they're so erroneously dividing that the system decides to put them, pull them down in the embryo. Mind you, we also see these type of things. So look at these regular nuclei. They go through their anaphase at the top panels I'm talking about regularly, and they regularly divide. But we also see lagging chromosomes. You can see that the nuclei divide, and you can see this with the white arrow here, the chromosomes lag during anaphase. And though these nuclei are divided, and they do get eliminated, like we see with the delayed nuclei. But importantly, there are fundamental differences between um, the karyotype damages that I'm showing you here that's been indicated in the literature or versus the delayed nuclei that we found in our study. And just to state what those fundamental differences are, so unlike the nuclei with karyotype damages I show here, mitotically delayed nuclei are coincident with early cytoplasmic divisions. As you see, the karyotype damages here are not associated with uh, an early cytoplasmic division. You can see the cytoplasm sits like the nucleus, basically. And unlike the karyotype damages, mitotically delayed nuclei don't break their nuclear envelope before chromosome condensation. So here, karyotype damaged nuclei are actually going into mitosis just like the control nuclei. And mitotically delayed nuclei that I showed in the previous slide don't form spindles, but 
the karyotype damage runs too. So that's a very big difference. And clearly, mitotically delayed nuclei don't have karyotype damages. They don't show these uh, weird DNA damages, DNA damage related uh, uh, karyotype phenotypes. And mitotically delayed nuclei slip nuclear divisions, which is to say they don't divide the nuclei, whereas, as you could see, karyotype damages too. So we thought that we might have discovered a new uh, class of nuclear eliminations that hasn't been recognized before. So you may ask, what's the source of local mitotic delays here? And how are the delayed nuclei extruded? So this is something that we study actively in the lab with a working hypothesis. And our working hypothesis is that because the nuclei are delayed into mitosis and slip division, we think that less than required levels of CDK1 may account for the observed phenotypes. What I mean by that is, if you have, you know, as you see in this gradient here, if you have high levels of CDK1 activity, you can break nuclear envelope, and that's followed by a cytoplasmic division. But if you have local lower levels of CDK1 activity, this may stall the nuclear divisions, as has been shown by many years of investigators. But the cytoplasmic division continues autonomously, and that may, that may help extruding these nuclei. So we wanted to test this. This is a hypothesis. And one of the predictions of this hypothesis is that if we were to slow the cell cycle by lowering levels of cyclin B, which is the key activator for CDK1, we may sensitize the cytoplasm to have more local mitotic delays. And we wanted to test this, so we made flies that express both histones with RFP and compartments with GFP. And then we did this with flies that have half the dose of cyclin B, which is their heterozygotes for cyclin B gene. And what we found was very interesting because what you're going to see here is that these cyclin B heterozygotes that you're going to see is going through nuclear divisions initially just fine. But what you're going to notice indicated by the dashed arrows that are going to appear is many nuclei that stole in their mitosis, delay into mitosis, and then start getting extruded. Yeah, when we saw this the first time, it was really fascinating because what we thought from the hypothesis just embodied in the experiment. Really, really rare, but an exciting occasion for a scientist. Importantly, if we do the cyclin B heterozygotes, our genetic penetrance was about 35%, uh, which is that three out of nine embryos show these extreme phenotypes of the delays and extrusions. But if we do this experiment a little more deterministically, where we induce complete depletion of cyclin B with uh, cyclin B RNAi, you could see that the proportion of the embryos that show percentage of the mitotic delays far higher than both the wild type and the heterozygotes indicated that indeed sensitizing the cell cycle with cyclin B depletion could induce a lot more local mitotic delays and extrusions. So that was the first major prediction. The second major prediction that this hypothesis said is that abolishing cytoplasmic compartments may be going to block extrusions. Because what I've shown you is that a successful extrusion in our hypothesis would require cytoplasm to divide such that it pushes the nucleus out of the blastoderm, right? And if we were to block cytoplasmic compartments altogether in an absurd manner, then the nuclei, which may delay still, won't be extruded. So we wanted to test this. And importantly, when we do this experiment, we use the damaged karyotype phenotype as a control. Because as I told you, the karyotype damages that are also eliminated from the blastoderm, we hypothesize that they may be eliminated through a different mechanisms than the mitotically delayed nuclei. And indeed, if we block the cytoclysin B, uh, uh, uh, if we block the cytoplasmic compartments with cytoclysin B, you could see that the chromosomes are still having those damages, and these damaged uh, uh, nuclei are still extruded. They're still eliminated. However, the mitotically delayed nuclei, which we hypothesized were different from the damaged karyotypes, in the cytoclysin B experiments, they're not extruded, whereas they are extruded in the wild type conditions. And I'm going to run a video here that show both the types of damages, A, the delayed nuclei, which we call type 1, and the nuclei with 
damage card attack with type two. And if you watch this video, what you go, what you're gonna observe is first a type of damage that's gonna occur with type one. And let's watch the video. Oh, sorry, it happens with type two. So this is the chromosome damage a phenotype. And here are type one. They don't condense chromosomes as you see, but then they do in a delayed manner. They won't divide. Yet the damaged one, karyotype damaged one, the yellow one, is going to disappear from the blastoderm versus the uh, delayed ones don't. So that really tested our hypothesis, our, our hypothesis on the extrusion of these nuclei and their dependency of cytoplasmic divisions. So to wrap up the talk, I'm going to do a little speculation on a possible physiological or at least one physiological relevance of why keeping cytoplasmic divisions in their autonomous cycles might be important. So under normal physiological conditions, the nuclear division cycle, which I postulate is a different cycle than cytoplasmic division cycle, go through a very in-phase uh, cycle together. So it is to say that as the cell is growing, you could see that the DNA is replicated, but by, by the time you have to segregate nuclei, the cytoplasmic division also happens. So that leads to regular mitotic divisions. But if for some reason the nuclei are stressed or damaged or go through some form of a weird stressor event in the cell, the nuclear division cycle may stop, but the cytoplasmic divisions don't. And maybe these stalls in the nuclear cycles might be eliminated by a cytoplasmic division that happens autonomously. And are we the only ones that see this? Uh, uh, but recognizing this as a principle, obviously, but if we do the, if we look at the literature, can we find other potential examples of that? And I'm pleased to say, yes, we can. For example, this work from Masatata's lab in London has demonstrated that if you stress the zebrafish embryogenic epithelial cells um, with an oncogene, overexpressing an oncogene called CERC kinase, like making a metastatic situation here, is essentially stalls the nucleus at its division, so the red nucleus is not dividing, but the cytoplasm, which is in green, divides. And importantly, what happens is that at the epithelium of the zebrafish in the organ, you could see that the extruded uh, nucleus with the uh, cytoplasm is going to mix in with blood, whereas the empty sac of the cytoplasm goes into the epithelium or the deeper in the epithelium. So their speculation is that this type of uh, what they call asymmetric division, which we would call a cytoplasmic division without nuclear division, might lead to uh, events of metastasis. And this is a disease condition. How about a regular physiology? Well, Harvey Laudish's lab from MIT at 2018 beautifully demonstrated that the progenitors of blood cells, and these are um, going through the maturation of the blood cell formation, as you see, they have this division of the cytoplasm that you're looking at with actin. The nucleus is in the one compartment, but the other compartment here, you see one compartment is the nucleus, but the other compartment doesn't. So it goes through this special form of division that doesn't involve nuclear division. And the empty sac essentially becomes the mature red blood cell without nucleus. And I'm sure those of you who study medical school know this pretty well. Um, and we think that maybe that's due to some uh, endogenous stress there that help uh, these divisions thrive. I'm really excited to explore these things or see others explore these concepts in their own laboratories. And finally, all of this might help the biodiversity in the types of cell cycles. I think majority of you in the classrooms have been indoctrinated by mitotic cycles. But let me tell you this, there are other types of cell cycles. So cell cycle doesn't necessarily mean a mitotic cycle where you have to form spindle. What do I mean by that? There's a condition called amitosis. These are cell cycles simply with cytoplasmic divisions. As you see, I've depicted here the two cycles of centrial duplication and cytoplasmic divisions do continue, and that's what reconstitutes the cell cycle. But as you see in this cartoon, you don't actually form spindle or break the envelope. 
the nucleus goes through a constriction that happens along with the cytoplasmic constriction. So this is fascinating. And for those of you who are out there to potentially discover something big, focus on amitosis. There might be something really cool about it. Or come work with us to focus on amitosis. <laughs> um, and, you know, this is not something that I show you in cartoon, but others have shown that uh, amitosis happens even in animals like flies, where you could see that intestinal stem cells could go through amitotic divisions to reduce the polyploidy in enterocytes to essentially go down to um, from very polyploid cells like 64 diploidy or 64C to 2C, which is diploid cells, which is really cool, but completely underexplored. So we think that in these conditions, the cytoplasmic division cycle is in action, but not the nuclear division cycle. And likewise, something is very well known, which is endomitosis, then again, polyploid cells, you have cell cycles without cytoplasmic divisions. So in this case, you have active nuclear divisions and nuclear spindle assembly, but you don't have any cytokinesis. So here, opposite to what I showed you in the previous slide, the cytoplasmic divisions might be selectively blocked. These are heavily underexplored concepts, and I think our finding, our discovery that cytoplasmic divisions could occur without nuclear divisions might open a new window in looking all of these phenotypes once again, and perhaps with a molecular eye. So in summary, I hope I could have gotten my message across today that cytoplasmic divisions are neither a consequence of nor driven by nuclear divisions. Cytoplasmic division cycles can run independently from the CDK cycling oscillator and are likely reset by an autonomous cycle of a post-translation modification indicated by our cyclohexamide experiments. A perpetual source of microtubule nucleation appears as one of the few strict requirements for driving cytoplasmic division cycles, and perhaps in the future screens involving to look at cytoplasmic division requirements, the molecular players could and could and will focus on that. Um, and finally, autonomy of cytoplasmic divisions, at least in the embryos, can safeguard the genome quality by eliminating mitotically delayed nuclei from the blastoderm. And at this point, I want to thank you for your attention. And if you have any further questions than today, please, please email me. I'm, I love uh, replying back and I love talking about science and any of the news that are coming out of our lab. Please follow us on uh, Twitter to uh, see what's happening in the lab. Thank you so much for all of your attention. Alo. Duymuyorum. Elif Nur. Hocam. Şimdi geliyor değil misiniz? Kusura bakmayın. Sağ ol, sağ ol. Değerli sunumumuz için çok teşekkür ediyoruz hocam. Çok bilgilendirici oldu bizler için. Dilerseniz soru cevap kısmına geçebiliriz. Hemen. O zaman Her ilk sorumla başlıyorum hocam. Stokinez hakkında bu kadar çok şey, şey bilinmesine rağmen stokinez üzerine araştırma yapmak neden hala önemlidir? E, şundan önemlidir. E, cell cycle yani hücre döngüsü e, alanı bir reforma giriyor şu an. Yani e, birçok kişi e, hala textbook yani ne denir ders kitaplarını okuduğu için bunların her şeyi bitmiş gitmiş olduğunu zannediyor. Ama ilk başta gösterdiğim gibi ve bugün de şunu duyma fırsatım oldu sizden Türkçe ilk defa hani otonomus clocks diye söylüyoruz ama otonom saatler hani Türkçe olarak duymak çok hoşuma gitti. Onu söylemek istedim. Yani bu otonom saatler e, e, keşfedilirken bu alana tekrar girmek. Ve bu alana yeni bir gözle bakmak çok önemli. Ee, ve şundan dolayı da önemli. Belki o arkadaş sorusunu sorarken daha e, önce slaytlarda sormuş olabilir. En aşağıda, en son slaytlarda gösterdim. E, şu sunumu bir kapatayım Elif Nur. Evet. Mehmet e, arkadaşımız uyardı beni. Nasıl evet. yapıyorum? Şuradan çarpıya mı basıyorum? Evet, direkt kapatabilirsiniz hocam bu şekilde. Kapandı. Kapandı. Evet. Tamam. Ee, e, gördüğünüz gibi değişik değişik hücre döngüleri var. Zannetmeyin ki her hücre döngüsü e, bu e, hücre spindle nedir Türkçesi? E, spindle Türkçesi e, iyi. Hocam. İyi, evet. Mitotik, mitotik iyi e, yapmayan hücreler de var ve birçok. Yani duymak isterseniz arkadaşlar merak ederse 
ben de iletişime geçerler yine bir zoom toplantısı yaparız ne zaman isterlerse hiç hiç yani sorun olmaz e, ve diğer önemli konu da şu kanser hücrelerinde mesela enerji regülasyonu tamamen değişiyor ve şunu görüyoruz e, e, kanser birçok kanser hücresinde çekirdek hücre çekirdeği e, bölünme kontrol mekanizmasını kaybediyor. Yani şundan dolayı kaybediyor. Ha, neden dolayı kaybettiğini bilmiyoruz. Asıl önemli olan bu. Bölünme yeteneğini zamanında bölünme yeteneğini kaybediyor. Bunu nereden anlıyoruz? Kromozomlar zamanında segrege olmuyor. Yani ayrışmıyor. Bu yüzden anüploiti, kromozom defektleri falan, falan ortaya çıkıyor kanserlerde. Belki bu şundan dolayı olabilir. E, çekirdek bölünme yeteneğini kaybediyor ama stoplazma kaybetmiyor. Stoplazma kaybetmediği için belki bu hücreler hızlı bir şekilde bölünmeye devam ediyor. Hatta normalden daha hızlı. Mesela burada söylediğim gibi biz e, e, stoplazma bölünmelerini çekirdek bölünmelerinden yaklaşık iki kat daha hızlı görüyoruz. Yani acaba bu kanserde de mi böyle ve kanserde hücre bölünme kararını kim alıyor? Çekirdek mi alıyor? Stoplazma mı alıyor? Bunu gerçekten araştırmak istiyoruz veya yani araştırmak isteyenlere yardımcı olmak isteriz. Ee, bunu söylemek istiyorum ve daha, daha çok şeyler var ama e, zaman yetmez diğer sorulara. Cevabınız için teşekkür ediyoruz hocam. Bir sonraki sorumuz YouTube katılımcılarımızdan geliyor. Y27362 enjekte edilen embriyolarda bölünmenin gecikmesi ne gibi sonuçlara yol açmaktadır? Çok güzel bir soru sordun Ayşe Nazlı. Çok teşekkür ederim. Ee, şu an yani şu an yapmak istediğimiz şu daha fundamental şeyler üzerine yani daha e, genel olaylar üzerine yoğunlaşıyoruz. O dediğin soruyu daha çalışmadık. E, şundan dolayı birçok soru ortaya çıktı. E, e, laboratuvarda da şu an yani 8 kişiyiz. E, birçok soru olduğu için daha o soruya gelemedik. Ama şunu söyleyebilirim. E, enjekte edilen embriyolarda e, bölünmenin gecikmesi şu gibi e, sonuçlara yol açıyor. Sinkaryonlar oluşuyor. Yani sinkaryon bu iki nükleosun, iki çekirdeğin e, kend, ayrışamamasından kaynaklı e, beraber yani füz etmesinden mütevellit e, şeylere sütmeyen ne denir? E, karyotype e, damage'lerine e, sebep oluyor. Çok özür diliyorum ya. Türk, yani çok çok ben özür dilerim. Sağ Pardon Ayşe Nazlı inşallah sorunu cevaplamışımdır. Cevabınız için teşekkür ediyoruz hocam. Bir sonraki sorumuz. Stoplazmanın çekirdeksiz bölünebilmesini CD2 siklin osilatörlerinden bağımsız olarak periyodik şekilde gerçekleşmesi bilinen hücre bölünmesi modeline ne gibi değişiklikler getirecektir? Sağ olasın. Kim sorduysa çok teşekkür ederim. Ee, bu demek oluyor ki yani stoplazma periyodik olarak bölünüyorsa ve CD2 siklin osilatöründen bağımsızsa başka bir osilatör var demektir. E, o asülatör nedir? E, şu an biz e, genetik tarama e, ya girdik, bakmaya başladık e, ve şu anlık bir şey söyleyemeyeceğim ama e, rekombinan e, silekleri falan hazırladık. Bütün deficiency e, e, kromozomları falan hazırladık. Belki 2-3 yıl belki bir yıl sonra bir cevabım olabilir. Belki başka bir kongrede de onu sunabilirim. <gülüyor> Umarım hocam. Cevabınız için çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Bir sonraki sorumuz YouTube katılımcılarımızdan geliyor. Öncelikle sunumuz için çok teşekkür ederiz hocam. Aktin korteksin kortikal gerilimi, hücrenin boyutu ve dış etmenlerle karşı yanıt verme yeteneği düzenlenmektedir. Aktin polarizasyonunda değiştirilerek bunlara ek olarak hücrelerin fonksiyonlarına ne, fonksiyonlarında değiştirilebilir mi? Değiş, kesinlikle değiştirilebilir. Kesinlikle değişebilir. Yani öyle söyleyeyim. Çünkü biliyorsunuz geçen yıl veya iki yıldan beri birçok çalışma Zehra'ydı değil mi? Zehra teşekkür evet, ediyorum hocam. sorun için. İki yıldır bayağı çalışmalar yapılıyor. Yani çalışmalar şu contractility yani kontraksiyonu aktin tarafından yapılan korteks kontraksiyonu hem çekirdeği kontrol edebiliyor hem de çekirdek bir şey gibi cetvel gibi çalışıyormuş 
Öyle diyorlar şimdi. Yani bu Nature'da çok önemli bir makale yayınlandı 2020'de. Bayağı atıp aldı şimdi. Ee, ve şunu söylüyorlar. Bu bir sensör gibi yani nükleüs kontraksiyondan dolayı oluşan geriliminden ve küçülümünden veya büyümesinden kaynaklı sensör gibi hareket edilebiliyor. E şimdi o sensör gibi olan hareketinden dolayı nelere e, yani downstream olarak nelere sebep olabileceğini araştırıyor millet. E, bizim sistemimizde şunu detaylı bakmadık. Bu bölünmelerin e, hücre boyutuyla alakası var mı? Yani mesela e, hücre boyutu bilmem birkaç e, boyuta ulaştığında bölünme oluyor mu? İlk analizimiz böyle bir korelasyon olmadığı e, yönünde. Ama şimdi e, postdoktoralardan biri laboratuvarımızda e, bir e, algoritm geliştirdi. Hem bir kod yazıyor. 3 aydır uğraşıyor onun üstünde. Bu kod şunu yapacak. Bütün hücreleri, nükleusları track edip bütün parametreleri, parametreleri bulup Neyin nedir, nedir, nedesinin nedesidir hepsini e, bulmaya çalışacağız. Hani derler ya mekanizma nedir? Yani o mekanizmanın arkasındayız şu an. Bakalım Zehra sağ olasın sorun için. Cevabınız için çok teşekkür ediyoruz hocam. Bir sonraki sorumuz. Öncesinde gerçekleşen kromozomal ve mitotik olayların stokinezde geçersiz kılınması ele alındığında asıl kritik faktörün fiziksel ayrılma olduğunu söylemek mümkün müdür? Ha, i̇şte bak, bak bu bu dananın kuyruğunun koptuğu yer. Neden? Neden? E çünkü hani başta söyledim ya kanser hücreleri bölünüyor, bölünüyor ama o kadar kromozom defekleri var ki yani düzgün bölünüyor diye demeye bin şahit ister. E öyle olduğu için de fiziksel ayrılma. Sitoplazmik division yani cytoplazmic division cycle tarafından emrediliyorsa, nükleus tarafından emredilmiyorsa işte o zaman ayvayı yedi hücre. E, öyle olduğu için belki de kanserin belli başka bir boyutu bu olabilir ama bu tamamen teorik bir şey. E, e, benim söylediğim bunun test edilmesi lazım. E, ve e, soruya hani tekrar bakarsak bu e, ele alındığında Asıl kritik faktörün fiziksel ayrılma olduğunu söylemek mümkün müdür? Ee, ona bir şey diyemeyeceğim çünkü daha biyokemyasına bakmadık olayın. Yani hani molecular players diyorum ya proteinler daha onlara bakmadık. Baktığımızda belki daha e, kristal bir yanıt e, verebilirim. Şu anlık ama öyle gözüküyor. Cevabınız için teşekkür ediyoruz hocam. Bir sonraki sorumuz yine YouTube katılımcılarımızdan geliyor. Aktin uzaysal zamansal değişiminin ve dinamik yapısının gen ekspresyonu gibi kilit olaylara bağlı olduğu yeni bulgusuyla aktinin hem kendi polarizasyonu evresi, polarizasyon evresini düzenleyebileceği hem de çekirdekten bağımsız organize olabileceği sonucu çıkarılabilir mi? Çıkarılabilir. E, yalnız e, aktin ve mayosinin e, nasıl bir cycle oluşturabileceği, daha doğrusunu söylemek gerekirse nasıl bir saat oluşturabileceği tam olarak belli değil. Belli değil şundan dolayı. Bazı gruplar bir negatif feedback, Türkçesi nedir feedback'in? Geri dönüş mü? Geri dönüş. Geri dönüş. Bir negatif geri dönüş olduğunu seziyorlar. Ancak problem şu, her negatif geri dönüş sistem biyolojisinde saat demek değil. Yani saatler bayağı robust, kuvvetlidir. Periyodunu şaşırmaz. Ama bazı negatif geri dönüş, dönüşler e, periyodunu şaşırır. Mesela perfect adaptasyon, per, e, mükemmel adaptasyon diye bir olay var. Mükemmel adaptasyon şudur. Bir bakteri hücresi mesela bir chemo attractant gördü değil mi? E, veyahut chemo disattractant gördü. Yani ondan uzaklaşacak. Onu gördüğümüz zaman yani bakteri onu gördüğü zaman Ondan yönünü değiştirmesinin sebebi devamlı bir negatif geri dönüşüm e, sirkülasyonu olduğu için onu hemen algılayabilmesinden kaynaklı. Bu şunu örnek. Negatif geri dönüşüm burada bir saat değil. Ama dışarıdan gelen inputlara binaen o negatif geri dönüşüm hemen devreye giriyor ve bir defalığına devreye giriyor. Yani periyodik olarak bir şey yapmıyor. O yüzden aktin ve mayosinde feedback bulan 
e, insanlara e, diyeceğim şey şu. E, bu bir clock mıdır? E, veyahut bu bir e, perfect adaptation yani mükemmel adaptasyon olayı mıdır? E, bu tam olarak belli değil. Barış sağ olasın. Yani bu soru çok önemli. Demek ki dikkatle e, literatürü izliyorsun. Teşekkür ederim. Cevabınız için teşekkür ediyoruz hocam. Bir sonraki sorumuz. Bir hayvan hücresini ele alırsak mitoz ve mayoz bölünmelerinin temelinde yatan Aa. genetik faktörlerin ve hücresel boyutların farklılığı ha. çekirdeksiz stokinez uyarlandığında da özgün karakterler farklı metodlar kazandırılabilir mi? Bravo. Kim kim sorduysa bunu kim hazırladıysa bravo. Ekibimizden hazırladık evet. hocam sorularımızı. Kim hazırladıysa bravo. Nedeni şu. Şimdi mitozda e, gösterdiğim gibi DNA replication oluyor. Nuclear envelope breakdown oluyor. Spindle oluşuyor. Mitotik E. Ben de bugün irşad oldum. Yani mitotik E. Bak yeni bir kelime öğrendim. Bunun olmasının temelinde hem çekirdeğin hem de stoplazmanın beraber bölünmesi var. Değil mi? Ama miyoz da bu böyle değil. Özellikle ikinci miyozda. İkinci miyozda DNA replike olmuyor. Yani birinci miyoz faz 1, faz 2. İkinci miyozda DNA replike olmuyor. Ve lakin sitoplazma bölünüyor. Ee, orada da acaba diyorum e, DNA replikasyon saati duruyor. Ama sitoplazma saati devam ediyor. E, bu çok ilginç bir soru tabi. E, ve bu da yine otonomus, otonom saatlerle e, açıklanabilir. Ama yani be, biraz yani dikkatli davranıyorum şu an. Hani bu bir hipotez. E, diğer açıdan bakıldığı zaman mesela e, miyoz e, genetik e, taramaları yapıldı daha önce. Birçok gen ortaya çıktı. Ama hala bu genlerin ne yaptığını Tam olarak ne yaptığını yalan söylemiyorum bilmiyoruz. Hakikaten bilmiyoruz. Yani saçma geliyor ama evet, herkes mitotic division'a fokus yani şey yaptığı için çalıştığı için miyozu kimse çalışmıyor. Benim şey söyleyeceğim şu arkadaşlar YouTube'da sayın seyirciler muhtemelen birçoğunuz ya lisans talebesiniz ya da doktora talebesiniz. E, lise talebeleri size de sesleniyorum. Nedeni de şu gerçekten çok büyük bir şey keşfetmek istiyorsanız çalışılan şeylere bakmayın. Çalışılmayan şeylere bakın. Yani büyük şeyleri keşfetmenin belki bir yolu da o. Tabii ben bilmiyorum. Ben böyle büyük bir şey keşfetmedim. Ama belki sen keşfedebilirsin. Cevabınız için çok teşekkür ediyoruz hocam. Bir sonraki sorumuz YouTube katılımcılarımızdan geliyor. RAS aktivitesi CDK'lerde birlikte stokinez bölünmesine de aynı anda mı etkilenir, etkilini gösterir? Aynı anda etkinlik gösterir. Gülistan çok teşekkür ederim sorun için. Ee, vallahi RAS pathway yani çok önemli bir pathway. RAS, RAC, ERK ee, ve benim hatta mentorlarımdan biri Boulder'da Natalie Ann ee, onun üstüne e, çalışıyor. Bu Natalie Ann da map kinase, map kinase, kinase, map kinase, kinase keşfeden hanım. Yani ee, önemi de şu RAS aktivitesinin cycle'ın CDK'lerle Stoz bölünmesinde aynı anda etkini gösterip göstermeni ben bilmiyorum. Ve bunun da sitokinez bölünmesiyle beraber araştırıldığını da düşünmüyorum. Çünkü birçok kişi e, fokusu yani ne denir e, targeti şeyin üstüne koyuyor. Nükleer division üstüne koyuyor. O yüzden bence bu açık bir soru. Ama beni bunun hakkında hani şey yapma, sorumlu tutma. Çünkü ben rast çalışmadığım için tam olarak cevabını sana söylemeyeyim. Seni yanıltmayayım Gülistan. Cevabınız için teşekkür ediyoruz hocam. Bir sonraki sorumuz. Sentromerler, e, pardon sentrozomlar çekirdek, e, çekirdeğe bağlı sin, e, simetrik pozisyonlarda aktin ve mikrotübüllerin kontrolü altına dağılmaktadır. Çekirdeksiz bir hücre bölünmesi düşünüldüğünde bu dağılım mekanizmasında nasıl bir yapılanma beklenebilir? Ee, çek, şimdi şunu söyleyeyim. Çekirdeksiz bir bölünmede bu dağılım nasıl olur? Çekirdeksiz bölünmede çekirdek bölünmediği için Evet, kromozom segregation da olmuyor. E, sentrozomların da e, sentromerlerin de e, sentrozom mu dediniz, sentromer mi dediniz? E, sentrozom dedim hocam. Ha, o zaman bir dakika soruyu bir daha okuyayım. 
tabii ki sentrozomlar çekirdeğe bağlı simetrik pozisyonlarda aktin ve mikrotübüllerin kontrolü altında dağılmaktadır. Çekirdeksiz bir hücre bölünmesi düşünüldüğünde bu dağılım mekanizmasından nasıl bir yapılanma beklenebilir? Biz aynısını görüyoruz. Yani e, çekirdeksiz bir hücrede nasıl oluyorsa hani bu astral microtubules dediğimiz şeyler var ya sentrozomdan gelen aynı şekilde görüyoruz ve ki şunu düşünüyoruz muhtemelen o e, mikrotübüllerin kaynaştığı yerde interdigerating microtubules denen yerde bir şeyler oluyor ve onu anlamaya çalışıyoruz. Şimdi hem computer simulationları yapıyoruz hem in vitro deneyler yapıyoruz onu anlamak için. Yani buna şu an bir cevabım tam olarak yok ama benzerlikler var. Cevabınız için teşekkür ediyoruz hocam. Ee, bir sonraki sorumuz. Aktin aminasi sekanslarının ökaryotların evrimsel sürecinde büyük ölçüde değişime uğramadığı düşünüldüğünde hücresel polarizasyonların hücre gö- ve hücre göçlerinin canlı, canlılar arasında farklılıklar göstermesinin spesifik bir nedeni var mıdır? Şu soruyu şey yapabilir misiniz? Koyabilir misiniz? Tabii Aktin hocam. aminasi sekanslarının ökaryotların evrimsel sürecinde büyük ölçüde değişime uğramadığı düşünüldüğünde e, hücresel polarizasyonların ve hücre göçlerinin canlılar arasında farklılıklar göstermesinin spesifik bir nedeni var mıdır? Ha, vardır. Muhtemelen vardır. O da diğer proteinlerdir. Yani muhtemelen e, bu accessory protein dediğimiz kofilinler, profilinler bilmem neler. Onlarda bayağı değişiklikler var. İlla da aktin, yani aktin'i şey gibi düşün. Yani binanın temeli gibi düşün. Sen mesela binaya yeni bir şey mobilya getirirken binayı değiştirmiyorsun değil mi? Mobilyaları değiştiriyorsun veya duvarı boyuyorsun bilmem ne. Aktini de öyle şekilde düşünebilirsiniz. Ama ben yani aktin aminosinin değişip değişmediğini bilmiyorum. Buna daha önce bakmadım. Bunu hani o, onu doğru olduğunu baz alarak söylüyorum. Onu bilmiyorum. Ee, diğer bir sorumuza geçiyoruz hocam. Cevabınız için çok teşekkür ederiz. Zirosofilada görülen hücresel membranların çekirdek bölünmesinin son evrelerinde farklılaşmaya uğraması olayı hayvan hücrelerinin gerçekleştirdiği varsayılan embriyonik dönem ve hücresel farklılaşmalar nasıl değişime uğrayabilir? Gerçekleştiği varsayılırsa bu çok güzel bir soru. Bu çok güzel bir soru. Ve muhtemelen e, e, Ro, Rojef, Rogef denilen bir e, familya var. Proteinler. Bunların tipine göre değişiklikler olduğunu görüyoruz. Tam bir cevabım yok buna. Ama e, bir deney yapmak istiyoruz biz ve bu deneyde de tipleri değiştirip e, orada ne olduğuna e, bakmak istiyoruz. Ve mesela bir sinek embriyosunu bir e, fare embriyosu gibi develop ettirebilir miyiz? Bakmak istiyoruz. Muhtemelen bu size saçma geliyor ama e, yani e, denemek görmek lazım. Yani hiçbir şey aman be. Ne saçma şey. Diye böyle atlamamak lazım. Denemek lazım. Benim şu an bütün üniversiteden doktoradan dahi grup lider olduğumdan dahi bütün deneyler aman bu ne saçma denilebilecek deneyleri yapıp aslında onların saçma olmadığını gösteren e, deneyler oldu. Cevabınız için çok teşekkür ediyoruz hocam. Ee, bir diğer sorumuz hemen aktarıyorum size. YouTube katılımcılarımızdan geliyor. Stokinesis ve nükleer bölünmenin birbirinden farklı kontrol noktaları ve kriterleri olduğu öngörülebilir mi? Mehmetciğim çok güzel bir soru. Sağ ol. Ee, teşekkür ediyorum. Ee, düşünülebilir. Yani düşünülebilir, şundan dolayı düşünülebilir. Bunlar tamamen farklı yapılar hücrede. Farklı streslere cevap veriyorlar olabilirler. Çünkü bizim elimizde cytoplasmic yani sitoplazmik division'ı e, stres eden bir tek şey, e, nükleüsü stres etmeyen şeyi e, e, e, bulduk. E, maalesef burada onu söyleyemeyeceğim. Çünkü e, daha tam emin değiliz. Ve tam emin olmayı bırak, e, bu doğruysa e, çok önemli bir buluş. E, ve e, daha hani doktora talebesinin çalıştığı bir şey olduğu için de maalesef paylaşamayacağım e, şu an. Ama yayına yaklaştığımızda e, eğer sen bana e-mail'ini gönderirsen Mehmet e, sana o yayını gönderebilirim. Yani çok özür diliyorum bunu söylemez, söylememem lazım böyle şeyler ama e, yani bu hakikaten çok önemli bir soru sordum. 
Cevabınız için çok teşekkür ediyoruz hocam. Sorularımız aslında daha fazla var ama e, vaktimiz bu kadar. E, değerli ben, vaktimiz... ben şaşırdım Elif Nur. Yani kimse hiç kariyerle ilgili bir şey sormadı. Herkes e, stoplazmik divisionları merak etti. Benim çok mutlu etti. Aslında hocam, beni çok mutlu etti. Gel, oldukça ilginç bir konu ve herkes tarafından ilgi çekiyor bunun için. Gerçekten çok tebrik ederiz siz de. Fatma, Fatma diyor ki bak chatte vaktimiz var ama hocanın var mı? Var. Benim eşim de bugün konferansta, o da başka bir yerde. Çok vakit var. <gülüyor> Hocam o zaman size şöyle bir soru soralım. Bizler Birkaç gibi tane temel... daha. Aha. Tamam. Ee, bizler gibi temel bilimlerde eğitim almakta olan öğrencilere neler, ne gibi tavsiyeler verebilirsiniz? Valla ben size şunu söyleyeyim. Ee, kendinize bir idol bulun. Nedenini söyleyeyim size. İdol bulun. Ee, çünkü bir idole bakıp, yani bu Bilim e, sosyolojisinde çok önemli bir şey. O idole bakarak kendi kariyerinizi yönlendireceksiniz. Ve idolünüzü seçmeniz, yani doğru seçmeniz çok önemli. Nedeni de şu, yani gidip de ne bileyim e, böyle rastgele bir hoca, diyelim bir yerde çalışan rastgele bir hoca idol alırsanız ona dönüşeceksiniz. Ama ne bileyim bir Nobel ödüllü hocaları veyahut böyle önemli keşifler yapmış hocaları Hayatlarını okuyup takip ederseniz o size ilham verecektir. Ya ilham çok önemli. Yani ilham bizi yataktan kaldırıp laboratuvara götüren, laboratuvarda geç saatlere kadar çalıştıran, eve geldiğimizde hala başımıza ağrıttığı şeydir bilimde. Yani onu yakalayamamışsanız bence bilim yapmayın. Yani o, o, o size uygun e, değildir. Yani mesela El Nazzam'ın bir sözü var e, Arap e, felsefesi 9. yüzyıl e, e, ve şunu diyor e, El Nazzam bilim kendini ona adamazsan sana hiçbir şey vermez. Bilim kendini ona adasan dahi sana bir şey verip vermeyeceğiz kesin değildir. <gülüyor> yani bilime girerken Hiçbir beklentin olmasın ama ilham kaynakların olsun ki o seni yataktan kaldırsın, laboratuvara götürsün, akşam da geç getirsin. Çok teşekkür ediyoruz hocam. Yani dimağımızı açtığımız. Estağfurullah değerli ya. Değerli vaktinizi bize ayırdığınız için, bilgilerinizi bize aktardığınız için ve bu değerli sunumu bizlere kattığınız için çok çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Hem kendi adıma hem de bütün katılımcılarımız adına. Rica ederim. Ben çok memnun oldum. Beni onure ettiniz. Çok teşekkür ederim. Biz onur olduk hocam. Çok sağ olun. Size sağlıklı günler diliyorum. Sağ olasın. Hedefim.